things people have written down on their accident reports to uh, justify and get some money, you know, for their accident. And when you're writing quickly during times like that, maybe you don't think through everything you've said. But one man wrote, going home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> Another man wrote this, other car collided with mine and without giving warning of his intention. Uh, Another guy wrote, this, this man was all over the road and I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> I've been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. The pedestrian had no idea which way to go and then I ran over him. Uh, I pulled away from the side of the road, I glanced at my mother-in-law and I headed into an embankment. We live in a world uh, where the prosperity gospel, the message that we hear from Joel Osteen, for example, on television, dominates the popular imagination of what all Christians surely believe. And the message says that God rewards the righteous with health and wealth. And although they don't always say this, you can imply the following to be also true, that God punishes a lack of faith. I know this was true in the world of the megachurch-dominated culture of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm from and where I did my clinical pastoral education, which is a rotation that each person going through training in seminary in the Episcopal Church has to do a semester in the hospital. And it was common for family and friends in hospital rooms to be encouraging the patient to repent and pray for forgiveness so that God would heal them. And as such, chaplains like me were often asked, what do you think, chaplain? Don't you think they need to pray and ask for forgiveness? Clearly they've done something wrong. And I would say, I don't know why this thing has happened. But I know that God didn't do this. That's the best answer I can come up with. And that's still the best answer I can come up with. I don't know why this bad thing has happened. But I know God didn't do this. At some point, and it probably already has been for you, this will not just be an academic exercise. At some point, tragedy will force each of us to face this question. Why do bad things happen? And if we hear the message, if folks constantly hear the message that bad things happen, whether said or not, because I've done something wrong, God is punishing me, then as we go through those bad things, we'll lose our faith. And probably rightly so. In Matthew or Luke 13, 1, we read that some present told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And he asked the ones immediately who have reported this to him, do you think those Galileans suffered in this way because they were worse sinners than everyone else living in Jerusalem? And then he elaborates and he asks him another question. He says, what about those 18 who, on whom the Tower of Siloam fell? Do you think they were worse sinners than all the others living in Jerusalem? And then he answers his own question with a solid no. But then he goes on to say, to those listening, that they also need to repent. And then Jesus says something that's confusing in the context. He tells the story of a fig tree. Of a man who planted a fig tree in his vineyard, and the fig tree wasn't bearing fruit when he came to check, so he ordered the gardener to cut it down. But the gardener says, no, let me tend the vine, let me take care of it, let me trim it and fertilize it and water it, 
and let's see if it will produce fruit. Matthew tells the story, uh, Mark tells the story, and Luke tells the story, and they're all referencing the fact that Israel is called over and over again by the prophets, the vineyard. And the prophets are constantly wondering why the vineyard doesn't bear fruit and why the leaders aren't tending to the metaphorical vines of Israel. And as I've already mentioned, there's this textual tradition in Scripture, and Scripture isn't united on this. I need to say that. There's a tradition that says bad things happen to you because you've done something bad. But we can also see in Scripture, for example, in books like the book of Job, where Job's friends come to him and they say, Repent, Job. Repent, Job. You must have done something wrong. Admit what you've done. And Job says, I haven't done anything wrong. At least I haven't done anything else that I hadn't always been doing. And he refused. And at the end of the book, God says to Job's friends that they needed to repent for the evil they had accused Job of. And God says, and Job said nothing wrong. So Jesus says, in case you've missed it, bad things just happen. They happen to the good and they happen to the bad. And they often come without warning. And it seems like with this whole fig tree thing, Jesus is saying, just as the fig tree received another year, you must take advantage of the time you have because you never know when a tower might fall on you. Trouble can come upon a person at any time. It doesn't matter if they're righteous or unrighteous. But the choice we make is do we exercise faith in times of trial? For Jesus, death wasn't the end. But to abandon faith in the midst of the trial was tantamount to death. At least that seems to be what he's saying in Luke 13 when he says, repent or you will perish. Jesus, we need to say, was a righteous man. And yet, as we'll see in two weeks when we go into Holy Week, Jesus suffered in the extreme, and yet he suffered faithfully. And this is a tall order. How is, say, someone who's dying a slow death from cancer? What does reacting to that in faith look like? And as Christians, we say the answer is that it looks like Jesus. But how do we see Jesus model faithful suffering for us? Well, I want to say this. If we're asking someone to suffer as Jesus did, to suffer faithfully, we're simply saying, involve God in your suffering. And what does that look like? Well, Jesus, before he suffered, he pled with God that this cup would pass from him. He pled with God that this danger would be removed from his life. Jesus' suffering filled him with grief, we, knew, we know in Scripture. He wept with his friends who were weeping. And he wept the night before he was to suffer. Jesus' suffering caused him to question God. Jesus asked God on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wanted to know if God had abandoned him in his suffering. Jesus was abandoned by his friends. He couldn't bear to watch him suffer. This is what faithful suffering looks like. Questioning, tears, Weeping. In July 1941, a prisoner escaped from Auschwitz, and as a reprisal, the Gestapo selected ten men arbitrarily to die of starvation in a bunker. 
And one of the men was selected. His name was Francis Guy of Nietzsche. And when he was selected, he cried out and he said, Oh no, my poor wife and my poor children, I will never see them again. And at that moment, according to um, reports, a small man, a Polish man with wireframe glasses, stepped out of the line, took off his cap, and he said, I am a Catholic priest. I don't have a wife or a children. I would like to die instead of that man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. And he was taken to the starvation bunker, and, and on August 14th, almost a month later, he was the last to die. And according to reports, he kept up an interesting atmosphere in the bunker as folks could hear those dying singing hymns and praying for the month that they were caught. Forty-one years later, his death was put in another perspective when a crowd of 150,000 people, 26 cardinals, 300 archbishops and bishops gathered in St. Peter's Square along with Francis Guy of Nietzsche. And the Pope said on that occasion that the death of Maximilian Kolbe, the 47-year-old Polish priest who stepped forward to give his life, that he had won a victory like our Lord had won because he gave himself up, he gave his life out of love. Francis Guy of Nietzsche died at the age of 93 and he spent the rest of his life telling everyone who would listen about this love of this man who had died in his place. When people are suffering, when you are suffering, we will all ask the same question, and it's a faithful question. Where is God? And I think one of the answers is God is here sitting in the pews. And we have a job to do. To do what Maximilian Colby did. To relieve suffering wherever we can. To be to provide hope for the hopeless, to provide comfort for the comfortless, to weep with those who weep, and to say, I don't know, but I know God didn't cause this. So may we go out and suffer faithfully, and suffer with those who suffer.